Hello, I'm Professor Steve Miller. This is a class on Introduction to Compressible Flow for Rising Juniors and Seniors in Aerospace Engineering and Entry-Level Graduate Students in Aerospace Engineering. Let's start with some inspirational quotes. The curve described by a simple molecule of air or vapor is regulated in a manner just as certain as the planetary orbits. The only difference between them is that which comes from our own ignorance. Pierre Simon, Marquis de Laplace, 1820. Were she then to watch me live through it, she might smile condescendingly as one who watches a myriad dance to the strings that it knows nothing about. Pierre Simon, Marquis de Laplace. We'll have some quotes and history lessons through the course to strengthen these concepts and understand where they come from, both in a historical and contemporary context. Let's look at a basic outline of this particular course. The first module consists of six classes, which is an introduction on the subject. Today we're in class 1-1. This might change in the future. You'll see in your class handouts, which are available online, in fact all these pages are available online, and I encourage you to print them out and write on them. It starts on page 7. The page numbers are in the lower left corner. We'll then go through fluid basics, models, the equations of motion, including Boltzmann and Navier-Stokes, and basic thermodynamics reviews. You should have already had a thermodynamics class by the time you're taking this, and preferably a aerodynamics or fluid dynamics class. We'll then look at isentropic flow of gases. This is another multi-part series in the second module of the class, looking at isentropics, meaning entropy is not essentially lost in particular parts or streamlines in the flow. Then we'll look at the basics of normal shockwaves, which is probably the largest part of the class. And we'll take normal shockwave theory and go into a next module of oblique shockwaves, meaning that the flow is not perpendicular to the wave front. Then we'll look at Pranelmeyer expansion waves, which are a type of um, wave where the flow accelerates. Then we'll look at three classes on compressible pipe flow from Raleigh and Fano. Then we'll look at a particular special subjects like transonics, hypersonics, and supersonics. Well, in the class with particular interest that might lead into experimental work like in Schlieren images, which we'll look at through the class and we'll talk about what those are. And we'll also have a special topics class on CFD and perhaps a few others depending on the time we have. Every class I'll have a summary. This time I'm going to talk about who I am to the class very briefly. We'll talk about a class overview and look at the syllabus. We'll do this offline in one-on-one -on -one sessions in, um, in the classroom or virtually. And then we'll look at a number of visualizations of compressible flow just so you understand and start to get a feeling of the type of physics we're looking at. Most classes will start with a quote or historical figure just like this one did. This one's by Leonardo da Vinci, and he wrote in one of his notebooks, the great bird will take its flight on the back of a great swan, filling the universe with wonders, filling all writing with its fame, and bringing eternal glory to the nest from which it came. Leonardo da Vinci. On the right is the first figure, and all figures in the class are numbered. You'll see in this figure, he is from his notebook, and he draws a simple flight vehicle, where in this case, the person might lay down in it and face to the upper left. These struts or beams are meant to be holding like a fabric in terms of wings. Many early aviators, including the Wright brothers, of course, put their pilots laying down because that's how they observed birds. The birds' bodies are in the streamwise direction of the flow. That means the direction of the flow they lay down. Of course, later on, it was found that humans are much more adapted sitting while operating controls. But just like the Wright brothers and Leonardo da Vinci, they were inspired by biofluid mechanics and looked at birds in flight and the birds were laying down essentially face forward and that's why humans in these early drawings and even early aircraft were put in this position. Let's talk briefly about myself so you know who I am. I'm currently a professor and uh, my previous life was at the National Aeronautics and Space Administration as a research aerospace engineer in aeroacoustics. And I was a civil servant from 2009 to 2016, which is just a fancy word of being a government employee in the United States. I got my PhD through a NASA grant at Penn State Aerospace Engineering. 
received a master's degree from an NREL grant, National, National Renewable Energy Lab, also at Penn State. Before then, I did my undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering at Michigan State University. I also did studies in Taganrog State University and Eastern Michigan University. Taganrog State, of course, is in the Russian. And I spent much of my early life in Michigan, and I personally enjoy um, mathematics and art history as, as hobbies. This is a picture while I was at NASA of a group of my students, and this is actually at the back of an eight-foot hypersonic wind tunnel. The distance from the left to the right side of the exhaust of this wind tunnel at NASA Langley Research Center is much more than eight feet. Eight feet dictates the test section diameter. And we'll talk about supersonic and hypersonic wind tunnels briefly in this class as an application of the theories we developed. And so on the ground here behind the tunnel is much lower than the exit. And I was standing on the ground and giving a tour of my students. Some of them are summer students and some are master's students. A tour of the facility. So it was a lot of fun and I cherish images like this because it helps me remember all the wonderful students I've worked with. I personally liked and what inspires me most in life is probably the turbulence problem and the mathematics associated with it. And that probably inspires part of this class. And I'm often reminded of another famous person and quote to get us started. That's by, of course, Sir Horace Lamb. And Sir Horace Lamb, fellow of the Royal Society down here, in his book Hydrodynamics and Dynamical Theory of Sound, which I am happy to own a copy in my shelf, wrote, I'm an old man now, and when I die and go to heaven, there are two matters on which I hope for enlightenment. One is quantum electrodynamics, and the other is turbulent motions of fluid. And about the former, I am rather optimistic. This is also an address to the British Association of Advancement of Science. So there he is on the right, and many other famous people made similar quotes about their own field. For example, Richard Feynman, a great Nobel Prize winner and physicist who worked at Caltech in the Manhattan Project, made a similar quote. You can find many quotes today of people kind of taking this and apply it. Turbulence is one of the last great physical and classical problem of physics that is left unsolved. Here's another figure I wanted to show of turbulence maybe that is less theoretical and put into practice. This is the NASA Quest Smoke Vortex test at the NASA Langley 14 by 22 subsonic wind tunnel. Here, once again, they show the test section dimensions. It's 14 feet wide and, excuse me, 22 feet wide and 14 feet high. This technician here is holding a rod which puts smoke into the tunnel. And you can see it's entrained and the flow is coming from this yellow box in a recirculating pattern through the tunnel towards us. So we're looking upstream in the flow. We're looking in the direction of the flow. He's positioned this to see the, the vortex which is held above the aircraft. Of course, when these aircraft go into high angles of attack, they don't want the flow to separate, so they try to form a type of vortex above the wing. But look what's happening to the smoke. It starts as laminar from the tube, and it quickly transitions to turbulence, and it grows, and there's this large turbulent vortex structure that's generated by the wing. And so we can see turbulence in our everyday lives almost anywhere we go, which is very exciting. Perhaps you've gone to a restaurant or bar when they allowed smoking, or seen people smoking outside with their cigarettes or pipes or what have you, and you see that the flow comes out and it transitions to turbulence. Perhaps you've seen the waves at a beach and the water and, and the waves near the beach, and that's also in turbulent fluid. The airflow through our lungs is turbulent, and there's many other locations of turbulence. In fact, turbulence itself is everywhere in the form of fluids, which we'll get to their definitions in the next class. What is a fluid? Here's another picture of the Quest vehicle in the tunnel at subsonic speeds, and you can see how the smoke comes up, and it gets entrapped and entrained in the tip vortex of the wing. It's very beautiful. Maybe you think so too. I'm sure through this class you'll at least have some appreciation for the difficulty of the problem and its inherent aesthetics. In my research group, which is the Theoretical Fluid Dynamics and Turbulence group, I'm personally interested, and many of my students are, in understanding turbulence physically and mathematically. And we'll look at turbulence a little bit in this class, but there are definitely graduate and sometimes um, undergraduate electives on the introduction to turbulence. I'm interested in particular how sound is produced and propagated through turbulent fields. I like this problem as it's partly solvable. The turbulence problem itself is um, pretty much unsolvable today. It could be solved, we'll see. 
and it remains a central question of fluid dynamics. Um, a lot of interesting people have worked on this problem, and I'm hoping to extend their work. Now there's multiple ways to solve problems in research beyond my particular area, and they're in three categories, analytical, computational, and experimental. Analytical work, in my reference frame, refers to, say, mathematics on paper, which you've traditionally done in the academic community. Computational means you are numerically solving the problems. For example, if we can't solve a problem numer analytically, that is, with mathematics and paper, then we would do it numerically with a computer. In this class, we'll not look too much at computational problems, but we might do a few numerical algorithms on basic paper. Finally, experimentally is, for example, studying a problem with, say, a wind tunnel in this particular case, or some simpler device to control nature. So experimental work could be anything from a flight test to a wind tunnel to something in a lab. And a lot of excellent research programs actually combine all three of these. My personal research focuses on analytical and computational approaches. That is the combination of analytical work with computers. We try and solve problems analytically, and when we can't go any farther, we solve the remaining part of the problem computationally. This is a hybrid type method. Today, many research groups are doing all three simultaneously because they each have their, of course, advantages and unfortunately disadvantages. This class focuses almost entirely on analytical methods, that is, finding analytical solutions to high-speed aerodynamic problems in one and semi-one-dimensional frameworks. We also look at a few semi-empirical methods to get your feet wet, and we focus most on understanding the physics of the flow. Physics never changes, but our tools do. In academics, it's important to understand the physics and their application, especially in the engineering or mathematical department context. We also look at many contemporary applications in this class, and as I mentioned, some limited numerics. At this point in the class, I usually talk about the syllabus, but since the syllabus changes semester to semester, we'll bring that into our discussions um, online or within the classroom, and that's how I'll spend part of the first day. That way, everybody will understand the expectations of the class. Now, this class is based on my own personal experience as a NASA researcher, and number of journal articles, books, online, history, my personal experience, and many journal articles. This class is very similar to one that was taught by Professor G. Settles, who's now retired at the Pennsylvania State University. This is one of my favorite classes I ever took. Let's look at some of the books that the class is based on, and I highly recommend having at least one book. The upper left book, which this class is based on, is Supersonic Engineering, and that's where I pull some specific um, examples for uh, specific cases, but it's definitely not required. This one, Gas Dynamics by John and Keith, is very popular, and many professors ask students to have the Gas Dynamics book by John and Keith. So that's one book you might buy if you're interested. The one in the lower left, by Patrick Ustushim and Karskelian, Introduction to Compressible Flow, is one of the cheaper books, and I think it's a good introduction book. But it's definitely not as rigorous as, say, the book by John Anderson, Modern Compressible Flow of a Historical Perspective, which I think a lot of people like. And I would say that it's Anderson's best book that he wrote. And he wrote a lot of books, so that's quite a compliment. Perhaps the best books in Compressible Flow that are older are by Shapiro, Volume 1 and 2, and you can find used versions of these online. So if you're a graduate student and want to continue in this field, I would absolutely want to have Volume 1 and Volume 2 of Shapiro on my shelf. The cheapest book, and one that's often used in grad school that came out of Caltech, is by Leapman and Roshko. It's a Dover book, so it's usually under $20, and it's a paper bag. It's almost a must-have for the graduate students. If you're an undergraduate student, I would recommend either buying the more expensive Anderson book, or buying the moderate gas dynamics book, or buying the compressible fluid book. Some of the books have missing material from one another, and if they are uh, perhaps missing something, in the class website I've implemented the needed supplementary material. So you're welcome to buy one of these three books, and I think that would be a fine choice. If you want to talk more about that with me during class, that would be fine. 
So let's use the remaining part of the first day of class to look at a number of flow visualizations. visualizations. The first one I want to show is by, of course, Dr. Ernst Mach. And those of you in this field and maybe in popular culture have heard of the so-called Mach number. Ernst Mach was not the first to use Mach number in his research. In fact, later on in a conference, a committee voted to call the non-dimensional number Mach number after Ernst Mach. Nonetheless, his fame grew out of one particular interesting picture that came out of the late 1800s where photography was becoming very popular. What do you see in this picture? First of all, we call this picture a Schlieren image. Schlieren, Schlieren is German for streak, it's slang. And what we see in this picture are some white lines and some gray scale type colors. And what we're seeing is a still frame through a system of mirrors, which we'll talk about later. Let's just focus on what the physics is right now, of a bullet flying from right to left. This white object here, that's the bullet while I'm moving my cursor. Now the bullet moved from right to left across the camera face and mirror lenses. And these two vertical lines, which are white, are actually two wires. The bullet touched both wires and closed the circuit, which of course opened the shutter and closed the shutter of the camera. Now that's what's physical, that is, in terms of solids in the photo. There's also a fluid, which in this case is just air. If we can't see the light is, the light's being blocked by the bullet and the two wires, we also see these funny looking lines coming off the bullet. And Ernst Mach looked at these and was expecting them because of theoreticians and mathematicians at the time said they exist. And he saw this image. Let's talk about what we're seeing. I can tell you right now that this first white line that leads the bullet is a shock wave. It's actually a bow shock wave. The second lines that come off the trailing end of the bullet, this is the trailing end and the leading edge, and it's firing from left to right in streamlined direction, is another shock. It's the trailing shock. And then we see like this little checkerboard button um, pattern behind the bullet here, and we call that the turbulent wake. Now there's also this funny lines between the two shocks, and those are what we call expansion waves expansion waves. That's where the fluid's accelerating and the flow itself is expanding. The shock waves compress the flow and the expansion waves expand them. And so in this one picture we have multiple phenomena in fluid mechanics which dominate the physics of the problem which we'll study through this whole class. This is why I present this picture first. Not only because of its wonderful historical context but also because the importance of the Mach number Ernst Mach and it shows so much physics which we're interested in. Here I've listed some introductory YouTube videos. I'll also have these as mp4 files and you're welcome to check these out on your own through YouTube or Google searches and they show many types of these types of movies. For example Schlieren Optics will show you how Schlieren are made and they look at the same type of picture but in movie form from Ernst Mach's bullet with much better quality of course because we have digital cameras today. The Schlieren of matches will look at flame evolution, supersonic jet impingement and we'll look at supersonic jets in this class and a recent engine test from SpaceX the NACA airfoil transonic condition, which is a flow speed and regime. We'll look at contemporary hypersonics problems and developments in our society, and we'll look at a volcano eruption. All these have compressible flow phenomena happening, which you'll understand through this class. It's rather exciting. Now let's look at some particular images from the Air Force Museum of application of our theory understanding of physics to flight vehicles in aerospace engineering. Here's one particular picture where it's almost impossible to get the aircrafts in their entire frame of the camera. In the upper left you see vehicles like the XB-70 and the lower vehicle which is many many students vehicle uh, or favorite vehicle which is of course an SR-71 type variant. Um, so here's the cockpit, leaning edge of the vehicles off the frame and you can see this fuselage of the vehicle flaming gear down. This is just an application of a lot of the physics that you can design vehicles like this. And we'll look at the SR-71 inlet design in terms of a few figures in this class.
Here's the actual inlet of the same aircraft of this SR-71. And you see there's many little holes in here. This is a center cowl of the engine. That's an arrow spike. And the airflow goes from left to right. And some of the airflow, of course, goes around the outside of the aircraft, but a lot of it's ingested in the engine. And this engine and aero spike actually moves forward and backward while the plane is flying. And we'll talk about its position to create an optimal flow through the engine and compress the air at high speeds. We'll look at that problem in detail and do a few calculations ourselves. You also see there's like little holes or notches and things in the inside of the engine. And we'll talk about why those are there too. Very curious. Here's another application of this theory, which is a very old subject in itself, not as old as some, but in science it's moderately old, is the XLR-99 engine, and this engine in particular powered the famous X-15 aircraft, which I'll try and talk about later, which is hypersonics research vehicle from NASA. This little engine, which is pretty tiny when you look at it, is the world's first restartable and throttable liquid rocket engine. Beautiful. Here are some other vehicles that we'll try and understand through the class. There's the Boeing X-20 Dinosaur Program, another X-plane, which is an experimental X-plane, which was a program through the U.S. Air Force. You can see on these types of reentry bodies, they came in from high orbit and outer space, and they glided in, and you can see their discolorations on the bottoms of the vehicles, which is, of course, due to aerodynamic heating and ablation of the material. These early vehicles were, of course, used to design re-entry vehicles like the space shuttle. Now let's take some time to look at the work and pictures of Van Dyke from his famous book on flow visualizations. So these are some pictures which I've just taken from the book for educational use. And it's just like Ernst Mach's pictures, but now we introduce the so-called Mach number. And you can see in my cursor right here, I have M equals a value here and here. So from top to bottom, we're going from slower to higher speed. Now the camera is in fixed frame and the bullet, or this projectile, goes from right to left and we take a picture as it passes the frame. And these are Schlieren images, so these colors indicate something about the flow. In a Schlieren, the darker or lighter the image, the higher the density gradient. So what we're seeing are the shadows caused by the refraction of light through the density gradients of the flow. So we're visualizing the bending of light, which is in a way proportional to the density gradients in the flow. In the upper one, we're going at Mach 0.840. So Mach number in this case is going to be the velocity of the vehicle divided by the ambient speed of sound. Velocity of the vehicle divided by the ambient speed of sound. So 0.840, we're seeing some of these strange colors behind the bullet. At higher speed, it's say 0.885, which is only 0.045 higher. We're starting to see like little notches appear on the projectile. Those are actually shock waves, and they're wrapped around the, the whole projectile. Remember, this is in three dimensions. And so this little shock wave here appears all the way around in like a circle around the bullet. Now we shoot the projectile a little bit faster, and we get to Mach 0.90. You can see that these shock waves, these these dark lines appearing on the bullet become stronger and stronger. Don't worry, we'll define shockwaves mathematically and more rigorously later in the class. Now we get up to Mach 0.946 and you can see they become bigger and then we get the 0.971 and they become even stranger in the patterns they're forming. And then we get to zero, Mach 0.978 0.990, and look at the changes of these shock waves around the vehicle. And we'll look at and study these when we look at normal shock waves in the class. And it becomes transonic. So we get the Mach 0.990, and that's our last image. In Ernst Mach's photo, his bullet, when he took the picture, was going higher than Mach 1. It was going supersonically. So these bullets are traveling at speeds which we call transonic and subsonic. We'll define those in the next class. Here's another Schlieren image, figure 13. This one is more of like a scooper wedge. And in this case, it's mounted in a wind tunnel, and the air is moving from left to right. In the previous visualizations, we held the camera still, and we let a projectile go from right to left across the camera. In this case, we're letting the flow in the wind tunnel go from left to right, and we're holding 
the device still. The devices are usually all black because the light can't go through and it's blocked from the camera lens. Remember, the flow itself is going to look as a grayscale where very, very dark colors or very, very light colors signify large density gradients. In this case, you see the flow comes from left and there's a shock wave that forms from the leading edge of the vehicle and these waves form and they coalesce into another shock. We'll look at this particular case later in the class as a homework problem and something in high speed flow for oblique shock waves. Here's another interesting picture. Now this one is also a Schlieren, but there's some zebra striping. So the little wedge which is put in this hyper or supersonic wind tunnel is causing this oblique shock and you can easily visualize it because of course the zebra striping is disturbed. You also see this zebra striping, this is undisturbed on the left by the way, turns at the edge of the vehicle. Why might that be? Well of course there's a density gradient along the wall of the flow, and that's because of the boundary layer, which is the disturbance of the flow near the wall. We'll talk more about boundary layers later in the class too. But the focus of the class is not boundary layers. Here's another certain image of a backward facing step in a wind tunnel. So the wind tunnel walls are this black part and it has a little contraction. The flow enters from the left and exits the right of this wind tunnel. And so this is another Schlieren image. And all these lines and strange granulations of the flow are basically different types of shocks and expansions, um, vortices which are compressed with all kinds of strange phenomena. And we'll talk some about that. Here's a little wedge which has a shock wave going across it in a supersonic flow. So the shock wave moves from left to right and it impinges on the triangle. And time goes from left to right in top to bottom order. So this is the earliest time and this is the last time. And you can see when shock waves move across devices like this, in this case it's a simple triangle, it's an experiment to understand the physics, we can see this very complicated and beautiful patterns emerging. And so this is where the shock is moving and the device is stationary. We'll look at those types of problems called moving stationary, or excuse me, moving shock problems. Here's a visualization of one of these cases. A beautiful little vortice comes here and it's paired off on each side behind the triangle. This is a transonic shock, a normal shock on a vehicle at Mach 0.84. And you can see the device here, and here's the transonic shock. Here's a sabot separating. For example, when a tank, a tank shoots a sabot, it separates and the projectile comes off. So there's the sabot, and there's the projectile. It moves from left to right, and so this is just a more advanced form of Ernst Mach's early beautiful photo. Here's a more contemporary version of Ernst Mach's photo, but of course without the uh, vertical lines. Here's an example at supersonic speeds, and we've just talked about these flow phenomena. If you look closely in here, and if you have a good enough uh, video camera, and if I stored this video file in high enough quality, you could see that along the edges of this projectile, you see strangulations here, and that turbulence. You can see, actually see the turbulence in the flow, and it's bending the light. You see some weak uh, expansion waves. You see this granulation of the photo behind the projectile, and that's, of course, the turbulent part of the flow along the boundary layers in the wake. Here's a cylinder, which is moving supersonically. That is, the flow is moving supersonically past the cylinder in a fixed frame. We'll talk more about these physics in the class. And here's one with a wall. So look at how this wave comes off the cylinder. Well, these waves bounce off the walls, and we'll talk about how shock waves reflect off of walls. And this is very important to understand for the design of vehicles, of course. Well, and once we understand shocks and oblique shock waves, we'll understand how the flow changes between them. And using basic compressible flow theory, we'll be able to calculate the properties of the gas around the device everywhere in the flow field. And by flow field, I mean space-time solution of the equations in motion. Here's a supersonic jet case which we'll look at in this class. This black part's a nozzle and is ex injecting high-speed, high-temperature air into the ambient quiescent fluid. These granulations are the turbulence of the jet itself, so this could be like a model rocket nozzle. 
and the flow moves from left to right out here and then entrains the neighboring fluid. Then you see these funny little lines coming out of the jet. Those are actually acoustic waves and if you look carefully you can see weaker ones that are sort of spherical centered around the jet itself. This is the famous jet noise problem to try and predict the statistics of these waves and to try and eliminate them. Of course that would make rockets and airplanes quieter if we could do that. If we zoom in to the region at the exit of the nozzle right here and take a time average Schlieren, and that is we take many Schlieren images and average them, we'll see pictures like this. The top image is the time average Schlieren and the bottom image is a single snapshot with a long exposure. So you'll see the top one looks smooth and the bottom Schlieren looks granulated. What you're seeing here are the shock diamonds, which you actually see behind high-performance aircraft and rocket engines on launch. So you're seeing a system of shock waves and expansion waves that alternate back and forth. We'll calculate some of these flows in this class and understand their dynamics. In reality, the whole system has turbulence in it, as you see these granulations. And you can just make out the shock cell structure, which you see in the time average photo. So the time average photo is actually averaging away and, if you will, smoothing out the granulations in a short time exposure Schlieren image. Interesting. This is a picture of an inside of a nozzle. And you can see this is the plenum. The flow goes through the plenum through a contraction and expands out. And it goes through a system of shock waves. And you might be wondering, why is it good to design a nozzle like this? Well, we'll talk about that in class about taking flows from supersonic speeds to subsonic speeds and vice versa from subsonic speeds to supersonic speeds. Here's one closer image of this part of the nozzle operating in a different condition and they have a zebra striping in the background and the, the, like the smearing of these images shows that there's actually this beautiful checkerboard pattern and we can actually calculate this checkerboard pattern through the so-called method of characteristics which we'll have a single class on in this, um, in this semester. A final image I'll show is much more applied and what we see in this particular picture is a photograph from the International Space Station of the space shuttle and the NASA space shuttle program going through reentry. So you see the stars and here's the earth and then there's a strange little line and right there where my cursor is, that's the location of where the space shuttle is. And it draws this like wake. The wake is the plasma. So when the air, when the space shuttle re-enters the atmosphere at any vehicle at high speeds, it heats up the air and it goes in the hypersonic regime. And the gas becomes, of course, a plasma. And that's the trail you see through the reentry vehicle. That's our first class today. Next time, we're going to talk about flow regimes, the idea of compressibility, and define the Mach number. So we're starting off slow to get everybody on the same page, but we'll quickly pick up and start looking at some of the mathematics and physics of particular gases. Thank you very much for your time today. I'm your professor, Steve Miller.